want to talk a bit about story and God's story and the story of God that we all inhabit as children of God. So I, I want to show you this picture here. Um, this is a picture of the end of the movie, The Planet of the Apes. And it's at this moment when the main character, uh, who up to this point has believed he has traveled across vast space and arrived on a planet where uh, apes and humans have kind of switched positions. The apes are smart, the humans are not. Uh, he realizes that no, he's actually jumped into the, the future of our planet, and it's the apes that have moved into the top level. And it's this uh, great twist at the end of the story. Uh, I love twists in stories. It's one of those things that if a movie's got a good twist, I usually uh, like the movie, even though the movie is kind of bad. If there's a good twist at the end, I, I'm like, oh, that was, that was an enjoyable movie. Uh, sometimes twists in movies are. Unexpected. I, I remember there was one instance where I experienced a twist in a story that wasn't intended. I had come home and there was a roommate of mine who was watching a movie that I thought was a comedy. And about 20 minutes into watching it with him, I realized it was actually a horror film. And there was a very big disjunction between what I was expecting and what was actually going on there. And in many ways, I think this is the way that the story of God works. Uh, we are wandering along in our lives, and for a while we think, this story is about me. It seems to make sense. Uh, we're in every scene of our lives. Uh, the camera always seems to be focused on what we're doing. But at some point, there's a moment when we realize that it's not our story. It's, it's God's story. And we see that in the Bible over and over. Paul, on the road, experiences a plot twist. <laughs> and his, his life is changed forever. And this is... This is an important thing to the Christian life. I think it's central to the Christian life. I think it's actually the thing that drives what it is that we do as people who live in the kingdom of God, is to live into that story, not the one that we expected all along, but the one that changed our lives. Because we're a story-filled people. And, and to communicate God's message, we need to be conversant with that story. Because if I, if I come up to uh, one of you that I don't know, and I ask you to tell me a little bit about yourself, a lot of the time... I'm going to hear a story about where you've been, about what you're doing. If I'm, if I'm telling you about someone else, I'm going to tell you their story. So to, to really communicate God in our lives, we have to be people who are actually living a proclamation of the story. Because story is central to who we are as people created in the image of God. Many of us might even fear that if we start to lose our memories, we'll lose our identities. And, and so this is why I want to talk about uh, God's story today. A lot of times uh, we can look at the way a story is framed, and that will determine our expectations of where the story is going to go. So uh, if it starts out with once upon a time, you assume that at the end it's going to be what? <laughs> Happily ever after, right? <laughs> now, if the story starts out with a dark and stormy night, you usually don't expect happily ever after. And if the story starts out with a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, you have something else completely in mind. Uh, when our when our story is focused on ourselves, though, uh, it can be very confusing because we start out thinking. Once upon a time. And then things happen. Life is difficult. There's challenges. And suddenly we, we realize, okay, maybe my life is uh, more of a dark and stormy night sort of story. <laughs> a lot of times I feel like I'm somewhere lost in the galaxy far, far away. <laughs> it's just the nature of life. If it's focused on us, then when tragedy comes, it rocks 
the whole framework. When difficulty comes, when there's times of confusion and heartbreak, and just the story doesn't seem to line up, we don't know how to place ourselves. We don't know how to hold on to hope any longer, because our hope was in the story centered on us, on our trip as the protagonist, not on God's faithfulness. But the Bible doesn't frame the story around a person like you and I, but around a person who was there at the beginning and who was there at the end. We have bookmarks in the scripture throughout all creation of the word of God speaking and the word of God being made flesh and the word of God inviting us to the wedding feast of the Lamb. In the story of creation, it turns out that the twist is it's, it's not about us. It's, it's, it's that we're not the hero, but we're the quest. We're not the protagonist, but we're the, we're the romance. We are brought into a story that was going on long before we were born and will continue long after we've ceased our breath on this earth. This story is a story that we live. And as tragedy happens, and as the hopes that we have are shifted or broken, God says, I'm consistently faithful in initiating my story in every part of your life. This is what the kingdom of God is about. And this is what's unique to the Christian story. There's, there's uh, many stories that have been told that have framed reality throughout history. If you look at the ancient world, you have lots of stories that tell about how people live and how people do things. And they're, in many ways, trying to explain what's happening in the world around us. I actually kind of like studying uh, Greek mythology and things like that because, in a way, it's the... Uh, the psychoanalysis of yesteryear. We have narcissists and things like that uh, come out of these images of Greek mythology. But in a lot of ways, they were looking at the world and wondering why do things keep happening in a certain way. They were cyclical in their mindset. I have a picture here of, uh, we have Persephone and Demeter and Hades there. And this is a, a Greek legend about why the seasons continue. Because uh, Persephone is down in Hades during the winter, with Hades in the underworld during winter. And then she gets to go visit her mom, and then things become summer. It's, it's explaining a cycle that repeats. It's explaining a pattern that's focused on human experience. But the story of the gospel is not this happens over and over and over and over again, but it's focused on an event, on the incarnation. And it's set within the framework of a creation which is made for something. In fact, even the things that cycle seem to all be pointing to God. We might celebrate the church year, but that's celebrating the event of Christ. We might look up at the stars and see that they cycle. What the theology of Genesis 1 tells us that those stars aren't the reason that we have times and seasons, but times and seasons are the reason that we have stars. It's almost like uh, God has this whole idea that he worked out beforehand and made all of this world as a way of living that story. And we can be sure of this. By the list of the plans, the Lord stands forever. And God is concerned with our life here in a very real and powerful way. When asked how to pray, Jesus responds with uh, many things. But one of the lines is, Thy kingdom come on earth. God's kingdom in heaven has relevance here today. Which means that your life has relevance in a very powerful story, which we all kind of know up here. But it's hard to live right here. Much of what I want to talk about is how can we recognize when God's story has been hijacked? 
how do we recognize when we started to live into a different story? And, and, and the second talk we're going to be talking about is how can we be aware in all that we do of the real story that's going on, the story of where God's living. So I wanted to uh, just point out a few examples of living in God's story. We have an example of Jesus sending out the 72 and the, the Gospels. Jesus has this plan of what he's going to do, but he sends out people to do it. Uh, in the heart of a man, his course, uh, in his heart of man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Uh, this is kind of the cognitive thing that we sometimes get. We can make a plan for ourselves, but ultimately, it's God's story that's going to win the day. We can commit to the Lord whatever you do. And the word for commit is actually kind of, the word is to roll up in the Hebrew. And there's a certain sense where you can translate this literally, roll with God. <laughs> roll with God, uh, and your plan will succeed. So, over and over in Scripture, this is just a, a spattering of the verses. Over and over in Scripture, we see in God's story, we are in the right place. Even if in our story, it doesn't seem quite right. And this right here is kind of the continuum of where we might seem to fall. Uh, we try to make our own stories. We have human efforts. We have our own things. But the story of God is that God is actually the one who takes 100% initiative. And he comes all the way down. Comes all the way down. And he lives with us. And he shows us a new kind of story. God's initiative is everywhere. And the story of Christ is that it actually affects every part of the world. That he's transcendent, but also eminent. There's, there's a, kind of another dimension to the story, which is that you are called in unique ways. But the one that empowers us to live in God's story is the Holy Spirit. So, we have a unique call that God's made us. And when we try to live into that through our own efforts, it, it can lead us off track. But the Holy Spirit is actually the guide. So these, these kind of axes make a cross in a certain sense because Christ is fulfilling all these things. Uniquely called, empowered uh, by the Holy Spirit. Um, a vision of divine initiative, but also the perfection of living a human life. So I want to say that this is the story we live into. Uh, God's story of 100% initiative, but also very particular in human life. Uh, the Holy Spirit and the unique call. They are all there in Christ. And this is the story we need to always be centered on. But in each of these categories, uh, I think there's a tendency for us to drift into quadrants where we might emphasize too much of one thing or too much of the other thing. So, uh, if you look up here, Phil says there's a magic yeah, there. I go. In this quadrant here, this can actually turn into practical atheism. Uh, when we think Holy Spirit, when we think divine initiative, sometimes we think, oh, that's really spiritual. We're relying on the Holy Spirit. And we're saying, God, God's going to take care of everything. And that's a good thing to have those emphases in your life. But if that's all you have, then there's actually no reason to have God in your life at all. Because He's going to take care of everything. And he's got His Holy Spirit, which is all at work. So that can be one area of our lives where we tell a different story. Another area is kind of the gifted gawker. We start wondering, why isn't God using me in my life? I know that I'm divinely gifted. And I know that, you know, God is in control, that he's, he's living this story out through his people. But nothing seems to be happening to me. Because we're waiting for some kind of divine wind to blow us to the place to go, or to some, some amazing event to shake us into the, the plans and the path that God has for us. We don't realize that God's unique call calls us to sort of live into the particularity of where we are, to take some steps. Over and over in the scripture, it talks about what is it that you're supposed to do? And 
the answer in the Old Testament is over, ju- over and over justice and mercy. It happens over 50 times that combination justice and mercy. And this is never connected to following the law, not following these kind of divine break ins, but the simple fact that you actually you know what to do most of the time. There's things that God has called you to that are built into us. We have a way of knowing what's right and what's wrong. And it's not to say that God doesn't come in and give us special words, but if he isn't, it doesn't mean you're off the hook for trying to live a life that's in God. And I actually look at counter-narratives to some of these things as a powerful uh, kind of medication. And I look at uh, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta as one counter-narrative to this. She heard God's call to go and work among the poor in Calcutta, but then sort of stopped showing up in her life in a certain sense. At least she didn't feel moved. But she knew what it was to serve and what it was to love. And so she was able to work with those people, not as a gifted gawker, but as a faithful follower, which is what we all need to be. There's another one. When we rely on the... the, we, We look at what the Holy Spirit is doing, but we try to do it all ourselves. This is the Atlas Complex. And this is uh, the one where you see all these things in the world that can happen and try to do all of them, which can be very overwhelming. Uh, We become our own sort of messiah. And that's very problematic because none of us are equipped to be Jesus. None of us have the power of the almighty, immortal, omnipresent, omnipotent God. We are gifted, but in our own way. So to remember that your unique call is something you need to be constantly aware of. If something comes into your life, an opportunity to do something good, but you feel this is actually not where I'm being called, not where I'm being gifted, it's not wrong to say no. It's not wrong to say, you know, I think that God might have somebody better suited with this gifting for this time. And when you see that the world is broken beyond any any hope that you can see of how they could get fixed, our response should not be despair. But faith that the Holy Spirit's moving in all these ways. But God is actually the one who continues to take the initiative and making things whole again. This is something that I fall into a lot. If I'm watching the news or reading about things around the world, I can get very depressed. Uh, because so much of what's going on in the world is oh, it's just broken. But there's a hope for me that that's, that's actually an indicator when I'm starting to feel despair that I've forgotten the central story, which is the cross. I've forgotten that God has already demonstrated his love for this world far more than I can do and continues to do so. That he's actually made a people that I'm just one member of. And that Christianity is not the Billy Tangus show. Uh, thankful. But rather, it's, you know, the church throughout the world working and powered by the Holy Spirit through the cross of Christ to make what is broken uh, whole again. That's the Holy Spirit's work. And it's something that ultimately uh, no one can do except for Jesus Christ. Uh, he has already done it, and he continues to do it, and he will do it. So that's kind of the strange period I actually live in. But we have to keep that in mind at all times. The fourth area is when we, we see our unique call, and we see what we can do, but we, there's no room for God in it. Um, and this, I think, is something that we can easily fall into. There's lots of good things we can do. There's lots of need in the world. And and you have been all gifted in powerful ways to be a blessing in one way or another. Whether it's in a big way or a small way, 
you've each been gifted. But if we're going out to bring the kingdom of God and we don't let God lead the way, we're just going to build the straw. It's going gonna, it's gonna to burn. It's going to fall apart because our foundation isn't going to be there. And we're starting to build a story that looks a lot like a story maybe on the outside, but doesn't have any of the substance of that story on the inside. It's like uh, anytime there's a, a hit book that comes out, you can usually find a few spin-offs. Uh, that usually aren't very good. Um, we can do that. God's the author of this amazing story. But to try to do kind of kingdom work without living into the kingdom of God, it could just be broken. And there's nothing there. It's just the work of our hands which, which falls apart. Jesus models for us something amazing that he actually does work as a human fully divine fully human but he, he, he works but he says that they're done by divine initiative I want to read you the passage right there uh, for God loves the son Jesus says and shows him all he does yes dear amazement he will show him even greater things than these so Jesus is responding to God in all he does. This is how he keeps himself in that story and shows us how to be living into that story. It's this response. Uh, God, Jesus says, I look to the Father. And I think he says this to show us how we are to operate as well. Because he says that even greater works than he has done, he will do through his church. So as we live into God... We can live into uh, all the works that he has uh, for us as unique people to do. Not that we move the story along, but we live into the story that's already going on. And I think there's a lot that's going on there. In fact, Jesus' life kind of images for us a way to live. Obedience to the Father. What God's doing, we do. What God's not doing, we don't do. And wherever God has called us, we walk. Um, another thing is, in the, in the book of Acts, I see something very powerful about God's story that's demonstrated. Uh, it's not a solo. To, to walk into God's life does not mean that you find your call by yourself and do your thing. It means that we walk as God's church into the plans that he has called for us. And we need one another. Over and over in the scripture, you need the other parts of the body in order for the body to function. You need to be connected to the head together in order to do the work of God. In Acts chapter 13, we see that there are unique calls in the community. There are prophets and there are teachers, individuals, Barnabas, Simeon, Lucius. These people are worshiping together. They are fasting. They are uh, listening to the Holy Spirit. And that's a communal thing. God's call is beyond individuals. God's call is to a community that lives in this world. So, if we're thinking, this is I think another common narrative, if we're thinking, you know, my life is walking with God. We've missed the point. If it's just focused on your personal relationship with Jesus or your individual walk, we've missed kind of the point of what Jesus establishes, which is a community of believers. The, the areas that you live, where you might walk into one quadrant or another, there's a good way, a good, good way that God might be pulling you back with another person that can balance that out. Uh, so if you find that you tend to be more of an atlas personality, there might be someone who you can involve in your life and pray with and be in community with that can, can move you back towards the message of the cross. So we see here, see, there's these different callings and giftings, and together while worshiping and fasting, they hear the Holy Spirit, and which sets aside Barnabas and Saul, other individuals, are. And they uh, 
they operate together in the mission that the Holy Spirit initiates. And I think this is kind of a beautiful picture of how the church is supposed to operate. So, that's the story. That's the story that we live. God so loved the world that he sent his only son that those of us who believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's the story. And Christ established a church which he empowered with his Holy Spirit and continues to empower with his Holy Spirit. This guy calls him and he draws him into this story of this amazing community of believers. And I think uh, it's one of the things I love about the Word of God community is it demonstrated to me what it means to be there for one another. Uh, what it means to have a commitment to live life together. But to live life in response to that story of God. So, in the second talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, basically creating little alarm clocks to remind us that we're in God's story, not our story. Because that's really what's key here. And that's what I need to be reminded of. Because there's a million things that, like I said, I could tell you to do. I could tell you about, you know, the droughts in Africa that we need to make sure those people are receiving. I could tell you about the way that, you know, maybe the moral fabric of our country is going away. I could talk about, uh, you know, new policies that we need to enact in Congress. I could tell you about uh, homeless people on the streets. Uh, I could tell you about a million different things. But that ultimately means nothing if we're not living together in the story of God. We just become people trying to lift the whole world by ourselves, not the power of God. And so when we hear thy kingdom come, uh, that can mean so many different things. But it all is rooted in one thing. Christ crucified and raised on the third So I hope that as we explore where God's calling each of us individually, we can always be reminded the center of it all is the reality for the singular event of God become man for our sake and for our salvation. Thanks. Yeah, and there's a balance that I think needs to be planned. It's not that we just live our lives and respond to need or need or need or just wait for the Spirit, but actually to have a structure in place in our lives that we're, we're being aware of where God is moving in our hearts. We're always checking in on that and responding to that area. And knowing where your boundaries are, too. And I don't think that there's one thing that God has for Marilyn that if you miss that, you miss God. 
Uh, thankfully, the story of God is that no matter what we do, God's not going to fail. You're not holding up the world at all. You're participating in God's initiatives. We are pursuing, we're going to talk in the next talk, pursuing paraclete priorities. Uh, the things that the Holy Spirit's already doing, we pursue that. But if, if you don't respond, it's not like it's going to ruin things. And if you say, you know, today I'm going to uh, work at this area of justice, and you're gifted in like 16 areas of justice, or, you know, bringing the kingdom, or whatever it is that you're gifted for, uh, and you say, I just can't be healthy doing all the things I can do. It's not like you failed God. And that's a good relief for me, to know that there's not one plan of God that you need to figure out. God's told us things to do, and I can be confident that if I'm giving water to the thirsty person or clothing the naked person, I'm serving Christ, regardless of if that's maybe what the ultimate divine, I don't know. The Word gives us things that we can do. And God's going to succeed, regardless of if you respond to or not. So that's a freedom for me to say, I'm just, I want to seek God whatever way I can, but if it's it's, I think discernment sometimes gets turned into an idol, where we, we turn discernment into the center of everything that we do. And if we haven't received a word from God, or we don't feel like we're the perfect person for the job, or whatever it is, then we just go, ah, that's not it. Or we receive every option and say, to only, in order to be faithful, I need to not see my family ever, because I'm always, you know, out there or whatever. So, yeah. I'm uh, for it. Yeah. Back here, I'm teaching a uh, Bible study to the high school kids at our church. Uh, does the whole Bible in 15 sessions. Um, and uh, start out in, in uh, the Genesis. I love the stories of the patriarchs because, you know, these patriarchs, the founding of the whole, whole Jewish Christian uh, religion. These guys were a mess. Uh, you know, I mean, they, they failed so many times and uh, screwed up so many different ways. And yet, you know, God had decided this is going to be my pathway to uh, salvation up through Jesus Christ. I'm going to use these guys, these characters, you know, and, and he, he redeems their, their uh, actions, you know, and, and corrects and works around. And, and um, so I think that, that as we go forward boldly trying to, as Billy said, you know, see what we're supposed to do, we don't need to live in fear that, you know, oh, we might have missed it. So, all right, uh, Keith. Yeah, I also was uh, inspired by the quadrant uh, of I don't know if you have a way of bringing it back up there, but uh, yeah, the four different uh, uh, you know, descriptions of sort of semi dysfunctional ways of responding to the Lord. And I'm just wondering, what is the functional way of responding to the Lord? What would your next picture look like if you had a cross here? And maybe I kind of got as far as saying, maybe you can have a circle and sound like a Celtic cross or something like that. <laughs> what, would it, what would it say in the middle about the person who's really responding to the Lord in, in all these ways in, in proper? You know, I think any time that we... Uh, we I, there's a ways of looking at the kingdom of God in lots of different ways. For me, the key term that I filter everything through is incarnation. Uh, so, for each person, that's going to be the, what's in that center circle is going to look different. But the, the key thing is always a response to God uh, with who he's made you to be with the Holy Spirit. So, I mean, it could look a million different ways, a billion different ways. I think each one of us has a unique call. Uh, But anytime you start to feel like you're not following the Holy Spirit, or, you know, at least working, because sometimes you don't feel the Holy Spirit, but, you know, recognizing that the Holy Spirit is the one who initiates uh, the work in your call, and God's the one who initiates the work in the world. Anytime that God loses the center, that is a problem area. So, I, I, you know, the circle is going to be different for you than it's going to be for me. But the key to what the center of those things in balance is supposed to drift them off into one or another direction. And I think that there's a sense, it's not about necessarily balancing both sides, but having both sides fully there. Because God, it's not like we, we have to move to the middle so that God's giving half the work and we're giving half the work. It's having 100% of God 
and a hundred percent of ourselves. That's the goal. And a hundred percent the Holy Spirit's work. And we live a hundred percent of our giftings and all that we do. So I'm not trying to create a quadrant where we, we, we find ourselves in the middle. But that it would probably look like those four things fully there, in a sense. Um, so, yeah. I don't know where it went. It's it's vanished. I took it off. So I'm standing near this. So at least you know. Oh yeah, that will Okay. Alright. First of all, this is really exciting. So I'm pretty awesome to hear this. But I just had a question about the quadrant as well. Um, I get three out of four, but can you explain a little bit more about practical atheism, the, this divine initiative, Holy Spirit, quadrant, like, how does that happen? Just didn't follow that all. Okay, so the idea is, uh, when we spiritualize the kingdom of God to the point where it no longer has any relevance to who we are, or who God's created us to be, um, it's not real atheism. We believe in God. We believe that God's at work. But if you look at how you live your life, that doesn't have any relevance because God's doing all the work and the Holy Spirit's the one who empowers everything. And we don't see that God actually is calling us to live into this as well. So it's practical atheism, not real atheism. So uh, you can be very, very holy people in kind of what you believe, but you're not spending any time living uh, the grace of God out in your own life, I guess. It's kind of cheap grace versus uh, uh, real grace or something. Yeah, I, I, throw, I threw that in there. I didn't come up with the term practical atheism. It's, it's bounced around a few places. I really appreciate what you said, Bill, about the discernment process and you know, not getting too hung up on that. I'm mean, just remembering the thought given by Deacon or uh, Dr. Dan Heffernan about serving. And I remember he said that. You know, if it's in scripture, you pretty much know the call to it. Unless, unless, you know, there's a definite no, like for something like you were kind of giving these examples, but you can't ignore your family. And, and there are times when, you know, the point of exhaustion or something like that. But um, I think that's a kind of really wrong way that we, we sometimes I like to get hung up on the discernment thing where. Probably in scripture, probably called to do it. Yeah. And one of the key things for me to keep in balance with that is actually the, the main ways in which I think God calls us are not in the great things, but in the little things. And so uh, I have an 11th month old son. And there's this passage I read from Martin Luther where he basically says, uh, he's kind of chastising the men of his time for not helping out with the kids. And he says, you should rejoice every time you change a diaper. Because it's at that moment that you know that you are doing God's perfect will for your life. <laughs> and uh, that's something that I remember every day. It's like this, it's one of those little alarm clocks for me. Like, oh, something smells. Looks like it's time for the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>